passage again this morning, um, I was reminded that I think it's very difficult for us to try and comprehend what that couple must have thought as they were visited by angelic host and told of what was ahead of them. But praise be to God for their obedience through all of that. Um, I came across a couple of hymns, uh, Christmas songs, um, this last couple of weeks. Um, these two I've never heard of before. Perhaps you're like me, you've not heard of it as well. One of them is Oh Hearken Ye. Um, it was written in 1954 by Wyla Hudson. And the three verses that she wrote um, capture, put the focus on each verse, put the focus on the birth of Jesus or what we would call the incarnation of Jesus. Um, that's the word that applies to Christ coming and taking on flesh. And she penned these lyrics. Oh, ye, hearken ye who would believe, the gracious tidings now receive. The mighty Lord of heaven and earth today is come to human birth. O hearken ye who long for peace, your troubled searching now may cease. For at this cradle you shall find God's healing grace for all mankind. O hearken ye who long for love and turn your hearts to God above. The angel's song the wonder tells now love incarnate with us dwells. It is, again, the birth of Jesus, the incarnation of Jesus that is the doctrine of Christmas. And today on this last Sunday before Christmas, I would like for us to consider the opening words of the Gospel of John, in which John reminds us, informs us of Jesus to include the fact that He is the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And I'd, and I, and I'd ask you to stand, but as you're standing, I was thinking, isn't it good for us during this time of year to have to stop and ponder such truths. We get so caught up in everything else that's going on at this time of year, from the, the gifts that I guess now primarily are delivered to our door, and we're waiting eagerly to see when they'll arrive, all the food preparation, all the decoration, but I think it's good for us just to stop and ponder once again uh, Jesus, our, our Savior, our Messiah. So if you would please stand with me, John chapter 1, I want to read the first 14 verses of this Gospel account. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And should anyone question, verse 13 makes it clear that salvation is the work of God. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And this will be our focus next week. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and this phrase is significant, full of grace and truth. I'd like to ask Denny O'Neill if you would please pray at this time. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate the greatest event in human history this week, the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, we reflect also that Your Word equally as great to us, mm -hmm. reminds us of your plan for salvation, our need for salvation, mm -hmm. the birth of the Savior, the uh, follow-up of the spreading of the good news about the Savior. Mm -hmm. And we pray this morning, Lord, that the many truths you teach us that touch our very lives through your word would uh, inspire our hearts uh, and illuminate our minds and change our lives. Mm -hmm. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. These opening verses of John's Gospel are concise, and yet they are packed with theology. 
It is profound beyond our understanding, and yet it is simple and sufficient to satisfy our hungry souls. It sounds like a philosophical muse, but it's actually exacting eternal truth that is nourishment for us as believers. And with an economy of words, John at the beginning of this gospel accounts declares to his readers that Jesus is God, a member of the Trinity, the person of the Godhead who reveals God to mankind, the Creator who is life and light, and the Savior who took on flesh to redeem sinful man. The first four phrases are our focus for this morning, and they are found in the first two verses. They are, first of all, in the beginning was the Word. The next phrase, the Word was with God. The third, the Word was God. And the fourth, in verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. The first phrase, in, in the beginning was the Word, that calls us right away back to Genesis chapter 1, where most of you know how the Bible begins, in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And we're informed here in John's Gospel that the agent of creation is Jesus. Look again at verse 3. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. But I also want you to notice more than that, not only that all things were created by Him, he is the revealer, that is to say, He is the Word. Now, when you think about this, don't simply think about an idea or a concept. The very notion of Word is an expression or a manifestation of something else. Jesus is the person of the Godhead who came into the world to reveal man. Now, we can affirm, we know this from Scripture, that everybody knows that there is a God. This is a result of general revelation. You probably know passages like Psalm, the heavens declare the glory of God. And not only that, but Paul writes to the believers at Rome that it's encoded upon the heart of every individual that there is a God. But we also know that all people born naturally in Adam suppress that truth in unrighteousness. And we should also note that such knowledge is not sufficient to save. As wonderful it is to look to the heavens and know that there's a God, that will not save you. It is only sufficient and efficient in condemnation. But praise be to God, He also gives special revelation. Now, when you think about special revelation, most likely the first thing you're going to think about is the Bible. The Bible is special revelation. It's through the Scriptures that we're told much about God and about His attributes. Not only that, we know that the Bible is the authority, it is the rule, it is the standard for faith and practice. Whatever we believe, we derive from Scripture, not what we think, not how we feel, but what does the Bible say? And not only that, it is also the rule or the standard for practice. How we're supposed to conduct ourselves as believers is told to us in Scripture. But there's more to special revelation than just the Bible. You recall in times past, God spoke through the fathers and through prophets and through the apostles. Not only that, but even further back, there were times that God spoke through dreams and visions. But the greatest, the highest level of special revelation is Jesus Christ Himself. According to Scripture, He is the exact representation and manifestation of God. To see the Son is to see the Father. To know the Son is to know the Father. You're still in John chapter 1. Look down at verse 18. We'll look at this next week in part. John chapter 1 verse 18. No one has seen God at any time the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. He is the Word, the manifestation, the exact representation of God. Now, in the New Testament, there's other places where this is also spoken, and I want us to go look at two of them, one of Paul and the other one, the writer of Hebrews. So go to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, and notice again this profound truth that Jesus is indeed the manifestation, the exact representation of God. He is the one who reveals God to us. Colossians chapter 1, I'm at verse 15. Here we read that Paul wrote, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And again, noting that He is the Creator. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. Now go to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1. We'll see another passage where we see similar things. And don't be confused here. 
as the writer speaks, he'll actually define for us what's happening here in this passage. So Hebrews chapter 1, I'm at verse 1. Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had purged, when He Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, and had become so much better than the angels, He has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So what do we see in these passages and in John chapter 1? Jesus is God, and He is the revealer of God. The second phrase teaches us this, that the Word was with God. It informs us that Jesus is a member of the Trinity. Now, the word Trinity nowhere appears in Scripture, but we see it in several passages. But I would say this. Whenever we speak about the Trinity, we have to be very careful. Most heresies are a result of either erroneous statements made about the Trinity or about Jesus Christ Himself. But I would tell you this. You can confidently say three things, and these are worth noting. If you don't know these, you ought to write them down and memorize these three thoughts about the Trinity. Number one, there is one God. Number two, God exists eternally as three persons. And number three, each person is fully God. So to summarize again, and these are important to know, there is one God, three persons, and each person is fully God. Now throughout the Old Testament, we see many examples or many passages of Scripture that declare to us that God is one. But I want you to see God's own testimony of Himself. So for this, go to Isaiah 45. Isaiah 45. You open your Bibles, about midway you'll find the book of Psalms, and you make your way towards Isaiah, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and then as my grandson says, some of Solomon, not Song of Solomon, but some of him, and keep working your way, you'll come to Isaiah. If you make it to Jeremiah, you've gone too far in Lamentations. Go back to Isaiah 45, Isaiah 45, and I'm down at verse 5. This is the testimony of God Himself. And here he says, Isaiah 45, verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting, there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Can I get an amen on that? By the way, this section of Isaiah, it repeats that idea many times. It'd be worthy of your consideration, maybe even later today. So there is but one God, but He exists as three persons. And there's, again, several passages that would inform us of this. One of them that I like is Ephesians chapter 1, which declares to us all the work of the Godhead in saving. But I think the most concise one, the simplest one, is actually found in Matthew 28. So go to Matthew 28. I remember hearing this as a young man, and I I marveled at it. It didn't really make sense until I began to understand, and as weird as that sounds, maybe I shouldn't say understand or just to affirm the truth of the Trinity. I don't think we can ever make sense of it. But this particular verse here does it in really a wonderful fashion, teaches us there is one God who exists eternally as three persons. This is Matthew 28, the last three verses of Matthew's Gospel. Verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. And here it is, we'll see now that there is one God, three persons, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So one God, there is one name, but three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. Not only that, each person is fully God, and this is what we are taught in the third phrase now in John's Gospel, the Word was God. We can say what God was, the Word was. If you want to make it present, we would say it this, who God is, the Word is. Now, some of you have probably heard of the false religion known as Jehovah's Witnesses. If you've ever encountered them, they will often take you immediately to John's Gospel, these opening verses, and they would tell you that you're supposed to translate that particular section this way, the Word was a God. 
Now, with that being said, there's a couple of things, again, it would be good to know. Number one, it would be erroneous to state that the standards of Greek grammar require such a translation. They do not. The reason they say that is because there's no article before God, but in Greek, you don't necessarily have to have the definite article for something to be definite. But more importantly, they completely miss the totality of John's gospel. Throughout John's gospel, the big point is, is that Jesus is God, that he is very God. And we are told to look at his miracles, the power of God that is revealed in and through Christ. But there's something else that is very important in John's gospel, and that is the numerous statements of I am. Depending on how you number of them, there's at least seven, perhaps eight, if you number them that way. Over and over again, I am. And in the Greek language, it only required one word, but Jesus, to make a point, used both the pronoun and the verb and said, I am. I am. Why do I draw your attention to that? For the Jewish audience, they would immediately think back to the Old Testament with Moses at the burning bush, who was sent back to set the people free. And he said, whom shall I say has sent me? And God's reply was, I am. Simply say, I am has sent you. So imagine Jesus probably saying it in, in, a, in a way that captured their attention each time. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no question they understood what he was saying. As a matter of fact, on many occasions, they took up stones to kill him. And some people would say, no, Jesus never claimed to be God. Oh, yes, he did. And I'd like for you to see at least one passage in John, John chapter 10, where it's crystal clear because even the Jews who were going to kill him State as much that that's what Jesus, in fact, did here. John chapter 10. We're down at verse 25 of John chapter 10. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, and here's the reason they didn't believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. There's eternal security. If you're looking for it in Scripture, circle that verse. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now hear this phrase. I and my Father are one. This reminds us again of the Trinity and the unity within the Trinity. The response of the Jews is found next. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Not the first time, but again. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? In other words, are you upset with me because I'm performing miracles like I healed someone on the Sabbath? Is that the reason you're upset? They make it crystal clear, oh no, it's something even much more important. The Jews answered him saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself God. Clearly, they understood what Jesus was saying. Make no mistake about it. And they wanted to kill him. This is a really interesting time of year. What is the common greeting nowadays when you go out in public? Or what is it that you hear? Yeah, that's pretty much it, isn't it? <laughs> We've been reduced down to that. Happy holidays. And if you say to someone, Merry Christmas, what are the looks that you get? Could you imagine if you were to go a little bit deeper, though, and say to them, isn't this a great celebration of the birth of Jesus, our Savior? <laughs> Could you imagine what would happen? <laughs> what? <laughs> right there on the spot. We understand that this is the truth. And this is why we celebrate the birth of our Savior, the incarnation of Jesus God himself. And we also know that the final verification of this truth is that he rose from the dead because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, the final phrase is significant as well. It's found in verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. This is more than a summary statement. This particular statement makes it clear that the word is more than a force a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Up until this point, Jesus had been referred to as the Word, so you might think He's just a concept, He's a force. This verse says, no, He is a person, a distinct person of the Godhead. 
And again, this is a mystery that's beyond our finite minds. We can't fully comprehend it. But indeed, one God, three persons, and each person fully God. And the member of the Godhead, whom we know as Jesus, the Son of God, is our Savior. He was and is life. And He is the true light which has come into the world. If you don't mind, I want to read again this middle section of John chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, and be informed once again to be refreshed of who He is. John chapter 1, verse 4, In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. And he was in the world, and the world was made through him. In the world, all people did not know him. He came to his own, that's the Jews, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. And once again, this is the work of God. Who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So Jesus is the Creator. He is the Revealer. He's the member of the Trinity, who is very God, a distinct person of the Godhead. With that being said, the rest is application or edification, however we receive it. But how should we respond to these glorious truths? What should we make of them? What difference does it make to you and to me? I have four thoughts. Perhaps you can add some others, but let me give you my four. Number one, first and foremost, we must see Him and know Him as more than a babe born in Bethlehem. This is what the world, this is where they're comfortable. Keep Him as a lowly infant tucked away in a cradle someplace and don't disturb me with anything else. That's enough. But we know Him as the God-man. We know Him as our exalted Messiah. And I would say today, as we close out this year really soon, if you've not yet repented and trusted in Jesus, that Christ is the one who came to save your souls. And may today be the day of salvation. To this He was born. To live a perfect life, to die to redeem sinners, and to rise for our justification. And with the Old Testament thought, if you hear his still, small voice, don't harden your heart. But today, cry out for mercy. Number two, next once again, to echo words that we have sung, come and worship, oh, come and worship, come and worship Christ, the newborn King. And I want to think about this in a couple different ways. Whatever you do, take time to meditate, to contemplate the glory of Jesus, the Word made flesh, who dwelt among us. I want to challenge every one of us here today to take time at this end time of year for private meditation and contemplation. Don't let this season pass by being busy, but perhaps take a drive and listen to Scripture, or, or find a lonely park and review memorized verses, or, or maybe take a long walk and sing hymns of praise. Uh, a friend of mine uh, told me that at this time of year, he would typically go on Christmas morning out to the shrine, out on, on 15. He said there was nobody out there. He would go out there before his family woke up, and he'd spend time with God. And I want to encourage you to think about doing something similar. Get alone with God, be still, and know that He is God, and be refreshed in private worship this year. Next, I would call everyone here, if you're able, to times of family conversations concerning the Christ who reigns on high and who is coming again. At Thanksgiving time, we're pretty good about giving thanks. But what about this Christmas, starting a conversation and asking once again, tell us how God worked in your life and how God saved you. You might know it from beginning to end, but wouldn't it be good to hear those things once again? Or maybe other stories of His grace, lessons that you have learned this last year from the Lord. Isn't God good? Let's talk about what He's done in our lives and His grace upon grace. And even though I know we're dealing with the end of yet another variant and another variant is on its way that will hit us probably in a couple of weeks, I do want to remind us again that we are called to corporate worship. To lift our voices, to sing and to shout so that the rocks don't have to cry out. I think rocks should do rock things. So let's make sure we praise God so that they're not called out to do this. May we live not merely in obedience as we gather, 
but find our soul's delight to praise Him together because He is worthy. Number three, I think this one's a little bit more pressing perhaps for us. Let's stop seeking to create and manage our own little kingdoms. Rather, let's daily, moment by moment, submit to the only King of kings and Lord of lords. Whether we like it or not, whether we realize it or not, while we dwell here below, we spend an awful lot of our time trying to make ourselves happy. Can I get a soft amen on that idea? And I think there are many things, many things that the five senses, uh, taste, touch, smell, hear, see. Which one am I missing? Feel? Did I get all of them? No, I did touch, didn't I? Whichever one I'm missing, all of those things, I think, have a degree of happiness, don't they? And I think they're good, and I think we can indeed thank God for His blessings. But we should know that the deepest longings of our souls What we oftentimes think of as happiness, better would be thought of as joy and peace, can only be satisfied in Christ alone. Um, Thank you for the many of you who uh, were mindful of me this particular last week. This is um, one of those uh, weeks that are really interesting because I turned one of those nines. My birthday ends in a nine this year, so that means I'm going to close out a decade and begin another. I know most of you are thinking you're probably 29. I'm not. I'm a little older than that. Yeah, I wish. Thank you. God bless you for that. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, um, you know, you know the math. Uh, I, I got old in my 50s. Uh, it was 55 when I got old. I still remember the day outside working outside, and suddenly I felt like I was going to pass out. That was it. It's all been downhill since then. What I would say is that I understand more and more each day that if you are living for yourself, Life under this sun, a striving really is only after the wind, and it is all vanity. Unless it's a life that is lived for and a life of seeking Him, it's all worthless. That's the only life that really has any meaning. And some of you are shaking your heads, I think, or nodding your heads in agreement. Those of you who are not yet, that means you're young and you don't know that yet, but give yourself a couple years and you'll figure it out. There is so much that we pursue, that's just not worth it. And if I could say at this time of year, stop each one of us from our daily striving to create and maintain our own little puny kingdom of comfort. And as the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then you'll find everything else has its proper place and even offers a degree of happiness. The last one I think is kind of interesting, might seem odd, But I call every one of us here today be shepherds. And you say, I don't want to own any stinking sheep. I don't even know Sean the sheep, so why would I want to be a shepherd? Turn to Luke chapter 2. You'll readily understand the reference when we see once again these early shepherds who were out in their fields keeping watch, were visited by angelic hosts. And you'll see what these shepherds did, and this is why I would call us to be like them. Luke chapter 2. Verse, well, let's go to verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, and here's the call, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. Wherever they went, they're telling everybody, here's what we heard, this is what we saw. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which they were told by the shepherds. So uh, I think our closing song today, I would say, go tell it on the mountains that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it to the nations that Jesus Christ has died to save sinners. Go tell your family, your friends, and your neighbors that Jesus rose from the dead in order to save us from our sins. Go tell everyone that you know that they must repent of sin and trust in Christ alone. Came across another really, really old hymn. It was written in the 4th century by Aurelius Clemens Prudentius. 
Um, I'm not going to read it in Latin. That's kind of interesting. I'll do the English translation. The title of it is, Of the Father's Love Begotten. Of the Father's love begotten, ere the worlds began to be. He is Alpha and Omega. He the source and ending He of the things that are, that have been, and that future years shall see. Evermore and evermore. O oh, that birth forever blessed when the Virgin full of grace by the Holy Ghost conceiving bore the Savior for our race. The babe, the world's redeemer, first revealed his sacred face. Evermore and evermore. This is he whom seers and sages sang of old with one accord, whom the voices of the prophets promised in their faithful word. Now he shines the long expected. Let creation praise the Lord evermore and evermore. Let the heights of heaven adore him. Angel host his praises sing. Powers, dominions bow before him and extol our God and King. Let no tongue on earth be silent. Every voice in concert ring. Evermore and evermore. Christ to thee with God the Father and Holy Ghost to thee. Him and chant and high thanksgiving and unending praises be. Honor, glory, and dominion, and eternal victory evermore and evermore. But better still, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And for next week, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Please bow your heads with me for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, what can we say to these things but all praise be to you? Dear beloved Son, who took on flesh, who spent months in a mother's womb, was a little child, about whom we know very little other than a perfect life without sin. And came to die for us, we praise you. And Holy Spirit, who for those of us who are children of the Holy One, we praise you, Holy Spirit, for giving to us life that we might cry out, Abba, Father. We cannot comprehend who you are, Father, Son, and Spirit. We just affirm it as true because you have revealed yourself to us in your word. And we praise you for the highest revelation of yourself. Praise you, Jesus, for coming. And thank you for dying. And praise you for rising from the dead. Now please grant to us a simple childlike faith that is so excited with this glorious gift that we not only enjoy it ourselves, but we want to tell everybody else what you've done for us. Praise you and bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.